Hi folks, and welcome to this week's Topical Deep Dive. And this week, we're taking a look not at a traditional streaming service or a new device. Instead, we're taking a look at an emerging internet service provider, one that's been making ambitious, bold claims about high-speed, widely available internet access thanks to a network of soon-to-be thousands of satellites in orbit. I'm talking, of course, about Starlink, and in this video, we're going to break down what Starlink is, how it all works, how it's different from earlier satellite internet options, and more. So if you've been curious what all the fuss is about, we hope this one helps. These are five things you should know about Starlink. But first... Okay, before we get into the details, I wanted to lay out up front that we're talking about a service and platform that's still very much in the early stages of development. We're filming this video in April of 2021, and Starlink beta testing is still a relatively recent phenomenon. So we're still a long ways out from determining the service's long-term impact. And beyond all that, there's a lot of passionate discussion about whether or not Starlink's approach to delivering internet presents too many drawbacks. For example, some in the astronomy community have raised concerns about the impact to Earth-based observations from so many satellites being placed in low Earth orbit. And Starlink has since attempted to reduce visual impact and light pollution through modified housings for its newer satellites. But again, we're still in the very early stages of this whole endeavor, and so its full impact to internet delivery and beyond is still very much TBD. With all of that being said, I just want to make clear this video is not a full review in any way, shape, or form. The focus of this particular video is strictly on how Starlink itself is designed and how it's all supposed to work. And like I said, there are some passionate voices out there arguing both for and against this approach, so I'll ask you all right now to please keep it civil in the comments section. Thanks in advance. And with all of that being said, let's talk about some satellite tech. Number one, what is Starlink? So in a nutshell, Starlink is an initiative by a company called SpaceX, and the idea is to provide readily accessible internet service via a vast network of orbiting satellites. And you might have seen news stories here and there about SpaceX deploying satellites in batches over the past few years. As of mid-April 2021, the company has launched 1,445 satellites into orbit, and when you subtract 67 that have since been deorbited, we're looking at 1,378 satellites currently in orbit as part of the Starlink system. And that number could actually be different by the time you watch this. The next batch of 60 or so satellites was scheduled to launch on April 28th. But since we're filming this a little before that, let's just pencil in around 1,400 or so satellites in place, give or take. Regardless, it's safe to say the Starlink system has hundreds of satellites currently in low Earth orbit with an eventual goal of thousands in place for the full-powered constellation, as it's often called. Number two, how does Starlink work? As far as actually providing internet access, here's how Starlink is supposed to work. We already mentioned the network of low Earth orbit satellites, right? So on the user side, there's a hardware package that includes a Wi-Fi router, cables, mounting hardware, and most importantly, a receiving dish. In the current beta test, users can download an app on iOS or Android that can help them install the receiver in the best location. And like earlier versions of satellite internet, a clear view of the sky is best so it can communicate with overhead satellites and send and receive data. The way it operates at the moment is that all those satellites in orbit work together to transmit information, and which ones your household is actually using depends on where you are and which satellites happen to be above you at any given time. Because these satellites are in what's called low Earth orbit, they don't stay in the same patch of sky indefinitely. So any given satellite your receiver sees in the morning might be well out of range later in the day. And that's why this whole plan calls for hundreds and soon thousands of satellites. So that at any single point in the day, there's at least a few satellites your receiver can connect to overhead. Number three, how is this different from traditional satellite internet? So if you're thinking, wait, we've had satellite internet services for years now, how is this any different? Here we go. So with traditional satellite internet, the satellites in question are placed in what's known as geosynchronous orbit. And that's just a fancy way of saying, as the satellite orbits around the Earth, it's actually staying above the same spot. And that's important for the satellite to be able to consistently deliver internet service in a given area. Now, to get a satellite's own orbit to match up with the Earth, it needs to be placed at a certain distance, roughly 22,000 thousand miles out into space. And indeed, that's what you'll see described on explainer pages from satellite internet companies like HughesNet. That ever-present satellite acts like an intermediary. There's ground-based equipment on one end and you with your receiving dish on the other. And the satellite sits in between that chain to send and receive data to and from your location. 
the receiving dish can rely on that satellite being in a consistent spot because of that geosynchronous orbit. And because the satellite is so far out, it can serve a large portion of the Earth's surface at once. Starlink's approach is different. So instead of a few satellites constantly overhead in the same position in the sky, Starlink is building up a network of thousands of satellites that are much, much closer to the Earth. In fact, most of the satellites currently in orbit are about 340 miles up. So in comparison, those geosynchronous satellites are more than 60 times farther out. And again, the idea here is that instead of a smaller number of satellites beaming your internet service to you, Starlink's relying on a whole grid of satellites communicating with each other and with your ground-based receiving gear. When a satellite is that close, it can't cover as much ground as those geosynchronous satellites, which is why you need a whole bunch of them to blanket that area. And Starlink says placing a lot of satellites much closer to you can help with latency, which, generally speaking, is the amount of time between when you issue a command and that command is carried out. That's usually measured in terms of milliseconds, and the more latency you have, the less responsive things can feel. This can show up in everyday internet use as, say, links taking longer than expected to respond after you click on them, or maybe a delay between selecting a movie to play on your streaming service and that streaming service actually responding. And it can really affect fast-paced online gaming, where splits second timing is crucial. And one of the off-sided downsides of traditional satellite internet is that the distance information has to travel to and from those geosynchronous satellites 22,000 miles away can lead to some pretty significant latency. And I think it's safe to say that not many online gamers turn to traditional satellite internet service for that reason. In fact, HughesNet's own FAQ section mentions the roughly 45,000 mile round trip all adds up to a half second of latency, or 500 milliseconds. And that's why even HughesNet itself says its satellite service is probably not the best solution for gamers, or real-time equity traders, where milliseconds matter. In comparison, Starlink says its system can offer much better latency and can potentially offer a more responsive overall internet experience, whether you're gaming, surfing, or streaming Netflix. And some of our friends over at CNET have been trying out the current beta system for Starlink, and they're reporting latencies of around 36 milliseconds and an average download speed of 78 megabits per second. But again, Starlink is still in the early, early stages of testing, so other users may be experiencing better or worse numbers. To sum up this section though, traditional satellite internet relies on fewer satellites that are farther away, whereas Starlink is trying to leverage a blanket of satellites much, much closer to Earth. And time will tell how successful that approach ends up being. Number four, how much does Starlink cost? So once more, we're dealing with a service that's still in its test phases, but taking part in the current beta program means signing up for $499 in equipment alongside service that's priced at $99 per month. Now that's not to say long-term pricing will be along similar lines, but we'll definitely continue monitoring the company's progress. For now though, if you want to be among the first to try it out, along with more than 10,000 other users so far, $499 upfront for the hardware and $99 per month for service are the current going rates. Number five. Where is Starlink available? Well, Starlink has been gradually opening up its beta testing to more regions over time. We first saw users pop up in areas like the northern United States and Canada, followed by areas within the UK in late 2020 and early 2021. And the Starlink website says the company is aiming for near-global coverage, at least for the populated world, this year. So once more for good measure, things are still very much in flux, but we'll be keeping a close eye on Starlink's expansion plans. So definitely keep an eye on Core Cutters News for all the latest on that front. Wrapping it all up. So there you go, that was a quick look at Starlink and I hope you found at least some of that info useful. And it's also worth pointing out that Starlink is definitely not the only one aiming to deliver internet through a network of low Earth orbit satellites. There are efforts from Amazon with its Project Kuiper initiative, the UK based OneWeb, Telesat and more. In other words, we're at the very beginning stages of what looks to be a competitive field over the coming years. For now though, thank you all for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, please do consider clicking those like and subscribe buttons down below. They help us out a ton and you'd be joining a pretty awesome community. Until next time though, my name is Philip Palermo. We'll see you all next week. Take care.